Vulcan Energy Resources is a zero carbon lithium project based in Germany and the new year literally started with a bang. Their share price went up by 80% in a matter of days when the new year started. The question is, why? And is the price justified? That's what I'll try to answer in this video. As usual, I'll wrap up this video with a portfolio update and I will share with you why I have decided to add a new position into my portfolio. And of course, because I am not a professional, this video is not financial advice or recommendation for you to do anything. It's just general information for entertainment purposes. So without further ado, let's go. So in my renewable energy stocks video, I gave a top-down view of the lithium ion battery supply chain. Then I did a bond map analysis of ASX companies who had the right characteristics and are strategically placed to ride out the electrification tailwind in EU. Vulcan Energy Resources was one, European Metals Holding was another. There is a third lithium project in that video that's not commonly talked about just yet. So feel free to check out that video after this one. To understand the value proposition of Vulcan Energy beyond the share price and people screaming stonks, let's define the problem they are trying to solve. And for that, I welcome you into my nerd castle. Here are all the things we know so far. Battery prices have declined substantially since 2010. And because of the price decline, the demand for EVs are growing substantially with EU being the second fastest growing EV market. And third, as it stands, majority of the battery supply chain is actually flowing through China and the pandemic have shined a new light on localizing the supply chain instead of being overly dependent on materials coming from Asia. On top of that, as consumers become more ESG conscious, they are expecting the materials to be produced with a lower carbon footprint. And that is not happening when the materials have to be processed in Asia. So if we just focus on EU, the problem at hand for them is that as the second fastest growing EV market, they are looking for ways to localize the battery supply chain within the continent to both de-risk their dependence on Asia for materials and also to capture more value of the supply chain within the continent. Because by doing that, you're generating more GDP and more jobs. At the same time, the solution to this problem will need to be green enough to help EU meet their Green Deal target. This is where Vulcan Energy Resources come into play. Vulcan Energy Resources is a lithium brine project located literally in the middle of all of the major gigafactories planned in Europe. Now there is a difference between a lithium brine project and also a hard rock project. I've actually explained the difference in the renewable stocks videos. So make sure you check out that video after this one. What drew my attention to Vulcan Energy Resources besides being at the right place, right time are two main things. First, zero carbon lithium. Instead of me telling you how it works, I'm going to let someone with a much soothing, British kind of voice to tell you how it actually works. Here's how it works. Lithium-rich geothermal brine is pumped to the surface at 165 degrees Celsius. The heat from the brine is used to produce renewable geothermal electricity, which gets sold into the grid. Energy from the brine is then also used to drive a lithium extraction process. Lithium is taken out of the brine and the brine is re-injected back into the geothermal reservoir. A lithium hydroxide chemical product is produced to be used in batteries for electric vehicles. So according to the investor presentation and that video, the heat when extracting the lithium rich brine is going to power the production process and can be potentially sold back to the grid as electricity. Now the second thing that drew me closer to Vulcan Energy Resources is that this is an engineering led company with an engineer at the helm. Founder CEO Dr. Francis Wedian's PhD is in exploration geology. Not to mention, co-founder Dr. Kruder is a geothermal expert with successful geothermal project development and permitting in Germany and worldwide. I'm not going to mention other people because there are some ex-Tesla employee rumors. And to me, that seems more like a consultant than an employee. Unless that is confirmed by the founder CEO, I am going to stay on the conservative side. Okay, so there are plenty of things to like about Vulcan, but they are not bulletproof. The first thing that concerns me is the price. Over the last few weeks, they went on a tear and the price skyrocketed to $4.99 per share. There's no way to pinpoint why the share price skyrocketed to $4.99, but I do have a few observations that I think have contributed to that massive share price action. Firstly, Germany and EU have introduced new legislations that's basically in favor of Vulcan, and that happened late last year. 
And then there is the lithium prices starting to rebound from the bottom, going from about $5,000 a ton to close to $8,000 a ton this year. Benchmark Minerals lithium prices are the most reliable, but if I don't have access to that, I generally look at top three largest lithium producers as a proxy to lithium prices. Albemarle is one of the top three lithium producers in the world. If you look at their five-year chart, it's pretty closely aligned to the lithium boom and bust. And zooming into a more recent time horizon, you can see that there is a very sharp price action since the New Year's. That seems to me are indicating that the lithium prices have rebounded quite substantially. And then there is the pre-feasibility study releasing very soon by Vulcan Energy. I think because there is so much optimism surrounding the company since last year, some people might just be expecting positive news and that might have contributed more towards the sharp price action from Vulcan Energy. And don't get me wrong, I am loving the fact that renewables are getting the attention they deserve, especially because this is an Aussie company. But I don't love the price action. And that's the first thing that concerns me about Vulcan Energy. The second thing I am actively paying attention to is their production costs. It's not clear what their production costs will actually be. And I'm hoping the pre-feasibility study will shed more light on that. But in the short term, they will have to compete against lithium hard rock projects that's producing lithium hydroxide at $5,400 per ton. I will say automakers and battery manufacturers might be able to justify Vulcan's higher price tag, if it is higher, with the zero carbon lithium to offset their carbon footprint. And finally, my biggest concern with Vulcan Energy Resources is when will they fully come online? In their investor presentation, they have said that full commercial scale will be between 2023 to 2024. One of the biggest lithium producers in the world have said hard rock projects on average takes about four years to fully come online and brine projects tends to take longer. But it's also worthwhile noting that brine projects take so long because they rely on the sun to dry the lithium rich brine. Maybe Vulcan Energy's proposed production process could defy expectations, but we'll see. Overall, I absolutely love what they're doing. It's the right time, right place to capitalize on the electrification tailwind. But personally speaking, I'm more on the cautious side because of price, production, costs, and also time to market. So I added a new company to my portfolio, but before I reveal, I want to remind you that this is not financial advice or recommendation for you to do anything, just general information for entertainment purposes. And secondly, I could be hopelessly wrong. Okay, I added Zoom to my portfolio. And as soon as I said that, I can almost hear people saying, wow, David is a <coughs> an idiot. If that's what you think, I'm fine with that. But here's what I think. When there's a disagreement on the understanding of a company, that's a good time for me as an investor. So let's start with the key risks because I'm sure that most people understand the upside of this company. The first common risk that I hear what people say about Zoom is that Zoom has no network effects. That means the more users joining Zoom, it doesn't improve the overall product experience. A good way to think about this is that when more people join TikTok or Instagram, your overall experience on the platform gets better because there's more content creators. And then another common risk of Zoom is that it's over for Zoom as soon as we are all back into the office. Understandable, but I will address that in just a second. And then another big risk is that Microsoft and Google will ultimately destroy Zoom. And then the last one that I commonly hear is that there are still plenty of security issues. Okay, so let me address all of them with my own thinking. On the network effect point, Yes, you're right. There isn't a network effect in the product currently, but they have nailed the product, hands down. It just works. The product was so good that despite all of the different choices that you have during the pandemic, people and companies flock to Zoom. And there are a rare few companies on earth that can achieve that kind of virality and cultural impact. So while there are plenty of criticism on the network effects, it's not enough to deter me. And then there is the point that when everyone goes back to the office, it's completely over for Zoom. If companies realize that they can operate efficiently working from home while reducing their costs associated with office footprint, I think it's very unlikely that they don't take that into account in their future strategy. And then there is Microsoft and Google destroying Zoom in the future. I personally believe that is a very intellectually convenient statement to make. Let's do a thought exercise, right? Name one high growth startup like Square, Zoom or Twilio that was completely destroyed by an incumbent's product. Let me know in the comment section below. 
Now, the time it takes for you to think about that answer is part of the rebuttal to that statement. I'm not saying that Zoom is bulletproof. I'm just saying that the chances of an incumbent's product completely destroying Zoom's product lines, the chances are very, very low. I could be wrong and I am more than happy to get schooled down the track. And finally, there's a whole security issue. But when that happened, co-founder CEO Eric Yuan froze feature development for 90 days, introduced a security council and got the former Facebook chief security officer to consult for Zoom. Look, the security issues will never disappear for these high growth tech companies. It's more about the management team's ability to navigate these challenges. And the fact that Eric can attract some of the best security talent to help him address this issue tells me more about the respect in the industry for Zoom. So with all of these different challenges, I just don't think it's enough to deter me. But the final thing I will say is the opportunity in Zoom. I can throw tons of numbers at you, but the truth is Zoom is just getting started with a 2 billion revenue in a 46 billion unified communication as a service market. That market is expected to triple by 2025. And if we dig into the solutions within unified communication as a service, and let's just focus on meeting solutions for just a second, in Gartner's magic quadrant for meeting solutions, Zoom is essentially leading the pact amongst Microsoft and Cisco. Google is not even close. And then if we zoom out and look at the broader unified communication as a service, in a very short amount of time, Zoom is one of the leading solution already next to the incumbents. So with just the unified communication as a service market, there's still plenty of room to grow into. Beyond that, Aaron Levy, the CEO of Box, actually tweeted this in May 2020, saying that Zoom could expand the total addressable market by 100 billion if they just had a paywall feature and other people have suggested going down other verticals like immersive experiences. And guess what? That's already a reality with on Zoom beta. It's basically like a marketplace where people do yoga sessions, cooking sessions, basically immersive experiences for a cost. So after all of that, despite what everyone thinks, I still think there is a lot of runway left in Zoom. Now, just a quick portfolio update. On my CMC market portfolio side of things, it's currently worth about 70,000 Australian dollars. And the upcoming change I am anticipating is that once the share purchase plan for Talga is complete, I am anticipating that this position will change. And hopefully in the next portfolio update, I'll have some more updated numbers. Before I show you my stake portfolio, a few of you have asked me again what I am using to track my portfolio. What is this essentially? And it's called ShareSite. It's just a tool that I use because I'm frankly a little bit too lazy to use spreadsheets and I'm not sponsored, but if you do want to try it for yourself, I left the link in the description box below. So with my stake portfolio, it's currently worth about 3,500 US dollars, which is approximately 45,000 Australian dollars. And like I said, the position that I did add is Zoom and I added approximately $2,500 into Zoom. So this is give or take approximately 3% of my portfolio. I have explained why I like Zoom, but I think the one thing I will add is that the co-founder CEO is so rare to have someone who cares so deeply about both the product and the customers. It almost really reminds me of Jeff Bezos in the early days, and he doesn't just talk about it. He's an action-orientated guy. So I'm really, really loving the founder and We'll see. Other than that, I haven't made too many changes on this portfolio and I still need to deploy an additional $2,300. So hopefully in the next couple of portfolio updates, I will put that money to use. And as usual, I'm not sponsored by Steak. But if you do want to try Steak for yourself, I'll leave a link in the description box below. So thank you so much for watching this video all the way to the end. If you want to be part of my fortnightly Q&A, not to mention some additional content pieces, consider supporting this channel via Patreon. Nevertheless, if you have learned something new, consider gently smacking that like button right there, subscribe to my channel and click onto the bell so that when I release future videos, you'll be the first one to know. Until next time, my name is David. Otto will always do the honors and see you very, very soon.